If you're offered the chance to make some easy money during the pandemic, what should you do? Money Clinic was emailed by 19-year-old student Henry, who, along with many other young people he knows, has been contacted on social media by people asking, do you want to make money working from home? It's usually on Snapchat or Instagram, and you'll get people just sort of coming up to you and going, you want to make 300 quid easy, you know, like... And essentially what they ask is you can go and set up a bank account with Metro or Monzo or whatever. They transfer huge sums of money into it. So what on earth is he trying to do with that money? Henry thought this offer of a fast buck sounded dodgy, so he turned it down. But as more of his friends started to be targeted, he turned to me to ask for advice. He may not know it, but Henry had unwittingly avoided becoming a money mule. Welcome to Money Clinic, the weekly podcast from the Financial Times dedicated to tackling real-life financial issues. I'm Claire Barrett, the FT's consumer editor. This week, I'm channeling my favourite podcast host, Phoebe Judge of criminal podcast fame, and taking you on a journey into the world of financial crime. Online financial crime, to be precise, and hoping to show how young people can spot it and avoid it. Hi, my name's Henry. Henry emailed the show with some questions about something he felt was obviously a scam. You'll get people who come on to online and they will, you know, sort of say, oh, do you want to make 300 quid easy? You know, like, and you go... Okay, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but I'll listen. And essentially what they ask is you can go and set up a bank account with Metro or Monzo or whatever. They transfer huge sums of money into it. So what on earth does this sort of entail? Because if I've got some random bloke offering me £3,000 and I'll get to keep a bit of cut of that, what on earth is he trying to do with that money? Well, I have to say, it doesn't sound very much like a good idea, but how are these approaches made? Is it on social media? People saying, you know, would you like to put some money in your bank account? It's usually on Snapchat or Instagram, and you'll get people just sort of coming up to you and going, yeah, listen, man, how are you doing? Like, they'll just be someone random. You don't know them. And I think it's a process of targeting. And do you think, or do you think your friends would think that doing that would constitute committing a crime? I mean, I'm assuming that it's come from an illegal source, then I've engaged in that crime. And so therefore I probably would be, could be punished. I suppose that's the issue. I, I don't know if you'd get punished or not. It's a very tempting prospect for young people, or indeed anyone right now, with income squeezed by the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, it's free money. And you're right, at the minute, there are no jobs going for so many of my friends. A lot of them are just searching and searching and searching for work. Economic student Henry is pretty savvy with his spare cash and has been getting into investing. But again, he's had some approaches on social media promising easy money that have made him think twice. There was actually a brilliant one. I was offered to invest in... It was semi-sophisticated, actually, because there was even a Zoom conference and I went along. But it it was all just a big scam because this guy said he owned Forex. He had like 50 people in a Zoom call. He had lots of men in suits in a conference building. It was probably the most sophisticated one I've ever been invited to. And I suppose it was more like, oh, we've got this great opportunity for investment here. If you invest in the Forex market today, our market, then um, you can be making up to like £10,000 every month. And it's very similar to other scams as well. As you get these individual traders, they'll be like, some 25 year old who has like a Mercedes S class or whatever. And he's like, oh, hey guys, making good trades today. Maybe you can get on my tips and tricks. And like for 90 pounds a month, they send you signals of what to buy and when, which is, it just sounds silly. And I feel like there's something illegal to that as well. So what does Henry want our experts to help him with today? I suppose the main sort of questions is around these fraud scams where somebody leaves money in your account is how do these scams work? And, you know, if me and my friends ever engaged in this activity, perhaps even unknowingly, would we be committing a crime? And where does the money come from? You know, they got this money from somewhere and it goes somewhere too after sitting in your account. So what's the purpose of it sitting in my account and where does it go? Anything else you'd like to know? Yeah, actually, any tips that you have 
on how to stay safe online would be really helpful for not only me because I would say I'm quite in tune but there's some things which I might get caught out on and especially some of my friends. So let's meet our first expert, Tony Sales, founder of crime prevention consultancy We Fight Fraud. He's a specialist in financial crime. I'll let him explain how so. Henry was approached by a random person on his Snapchat and offered easy money to just open a bank account, accept some money, pass it on and then take a cut. I mean, it sounds innocuous, but where does this money come from? So the money comes from all different places, mostly from accounts that have been taken over online. So fraudsters will gain people's information, most importantly, their banking information, and target their account, take over that account online and just transfer funds out of it. But of course, to get the money out, they need people that will allow them to transfer the money into their account. And they do this by approaching people on social media, claims of get rich quick schemes, all of these things, you know, that we see all the time. If it's normally too good to be true, it usually is. As you might have guessed, people who agree to transfer the stolen money through their bank accounts are known as money mules. Worryingly, during the pandemic, this type of scam has become increasingly common. Yeah, I mean, as soon as banking went online, it just changed the whole way this process works for for many people. So there's lots of it happening everywhere because it's very easy for criminals to online not get caught. The criminals know this and that's what they're targeting and that's why it's so just everywhere at the moment and we're living in really tough times so it's going to get worse. I mean nobody can be in any doubt that this is a serious crime and whether it's the fraudsters who are taking the money or people like Henry and his friends who might be tempted to help them spirit it away this is a criminal offence. Now if the police found out that somebody like Henry had been a part of one of these scams and helped to move the money what would the consequences be? So it's actually money laundering, yeah? Um, So the offence would be money laundering because your bank account would have been used for illicit funds to be washed through it. And that carries up to a 14-year prison sentence. And it's everywhere. It happens to many people. You can become a money mule without ever realising it and be prosecuted for money laundering. And Tony knows exactly why the criminals are targeting young people university students in particular. You know, university students need the cash. They're struggling. We all think that this is a victimless crime and they're not actually getting to interact with the victims. All they're seeing is £3,000 turn up in their account that they've got to transfer £2,700 out to someone else and they've kept 300 quid. They use university students also because they know that they're honest. Yes, you heard it. Honest students are invaluable to criminals. So if I'm a criminal, right, I don't want to target other criminals to send them money because the likelihood is that they're going to run off with my money. But if I'm targeting people that are going to university, that makes much more sense to me, yeah? Because they're not going to run off as quickly. They're going to be looking for a good education. So they're not in the, the, the knack of robbing other people you know they're just doing it because they think oh yeah i can make a quick few quid just that way and they're good people good decent hard-working people normally and they don't realize they're getting caught up in organized crime it's a horrifying fact and there's a reason tony has so much inside information like this on the fraud world i actually used to be a fraudster myself i've been branded as a Britain's greatest fraudster by the Great British Press, not something I'm at all proud of. Tony started off cloning credit cards, but as he reveals in his autobiography, the arrival of the internet was a game changer for fraudsters, turning our personal data into a new currency. So I kind of have an insight into that that way of thinking, and it's really easy when you think like that to find the places that you could commit crime or have crime committed against you. He now spends his time helping companies that store large amounts of customer data, a holy grail for fraudsters looking to scam us, finding weak points in their security. Most days for me start at around 3.30, 4am in the morning where I'll end up in a town somewhere looking at a building security structure. Sometimes I'll be dressed as a homeless person sitting in a 
in a little cubby hole just watching for the guard times of a building or I'm waiting to be moved on by a guard because I want to try and pickpocket him maybe. There's lots of different things that we'll do but it's mainly to understand the routines of a building and I always like to get into places when there's no one else in there because that's when you can cause the most damage to them and show them where their vulnerabilities really lie. Tony has some advice for people in the UK, like Henry, who think they might have been contacted by a scammer. It should always be reported to Action Fraud. That's the Cybercrime Reporting Centre for the UK. The US has the Federal Trade Commission, and in Europe, there's Europol. If someone approaches you in any way, shape or form with an offer that you believe to be dodgy, so you could do it with Forex trading, you could do it with online buying, you could do it with romance scams, you know, like... Anything that's happening online, it's happened to someone else previously before. Last year, the UK's fraud authorities shut down nearly 500 social media accounts, specifically aimed at recruiting young people as money mules. I've included some links in the show notes for this episode showing how listeners in the UK, the US and Europe can report an attempted money mule fraud. And it's important to stress that this is a global phenomenon. Criminals recruit money mules to create vast webs of linked accounts, passing stolen money through multiple bank accounts in different countries before quickly cashing out the proceeds, making it impossible to trace. But my next guest is using technology to fight back. Mike Nathan from LexisNexis Risk Solutions says more than a third of financial institutions are being exposed to money mule activity. It's a volumes game for the fraudsters. The more mules they have, the more mule accounts they have, the more fraud they can actually complete. So they need to have as many accounts as they can possibly have because every single one of those accounts will be used in a fraud situation and for them to be able to get to their money. In the UK alone, criminals successfully stole over a billion pounds through fraud and scams last year, according to data from UK Finance, the banking industry body. Money mules play a vital role in this, but the criminals controlling the mules are known as herders. So what Henry really wants to know is where is this money coming from and where is the money going afterwards? It's a very good question. In this situation, I guess you always have a victim and a beneficiary. So the victim in this situation is somebody who's unfortunately been scammed or had money stolen from their account. And then the beneficiary is typically what we'd call a mule herder in this situation. And the herder is the fraudster. They are the person who's actually committed the fraud. They're the person who's actually done the social engineering and they want to get their money as a reward for tricking and acting as a con artist towards the victim. They need to get to their money and they're not going to transfer it to their own account. So they'd use someone like Henry's account as the money mule to transfer those funds to that and then they can get access to the money. That money could potentially include the proceeds of investment fraud, such as the Forex and cryptocurrency investment seminars that Henry has noticed popping up on his social media accounts. Mike explains that criminal herders target different kinds of money mules to take away the stolen cash. There's three different types of mules. You have recruited mules, which would probably be Henry in this situation, where the mule herder is convinced or offered to pay somebody who to use their own account or open up a new account. We have the unwitting mules, where the mule doesn't even know that they're actually involved in it. Their account's just been you know, accessed, and then the money moved on maybe to a, what we'd call a second-generation mule. And then you have purpose-open mules, which is where they just open these accounts specifically to commit the mule fraud. Mike's company develops algorithms to help banks identify patterns in the data that are suggestive of money mooling. Under UK law, banks have the power to freeze accounts if they suspect fraud. But it doesn't stop there. Money mules can easily be tracked down and could face a criminal conviction. You know, if you use any of these, open any type of bank account, you generally have to send your passport photo in, even if you're doing it online. So for me, when you're a money mule, it's binary because there was a fraud and the money went somewhere. And that should be really the only question. And the secondary question is, did that person know that that money was coming? Did they move it? Did they do anything with it? And yes, that potentially leads to criminal conviction because it isn't a criminal offence. There can be other repercussions as well, such as being able to open bank accounts in the future. Anything that has the word fraud on it 
is not a good thing for your future career. If you've been confirmed as a, a known mule, you will potentially have more challenges around getting into the financial system. On top of all that, Mike stresses that this is not a victimless crime, something that anyone who's tempted to make a fast buck should really think about. The fundamental for me and what Henry should be thinking about is these fraudsters are typically targeting vulnerable people who typically might not be as adept as using the internet. And what we've seen is that as a result of the lockdowns, you've got a lot more people online who might be you know, elderly customers who are using internet banking for the first time. Previously, they used to go to the branch every, every week to collect their money. And these people are being targeted by these fraudsters to actually move that money that needs to go to an account. If you're suddenly starting to feel worried about your own online safety, Mike has some useful tips for all of us to avoid fraud online. There's an old adage, I guess, if it seems too good to be true, then it often is, is probably one to look at that. Anything that involves people opening bank accounts and things around banking is quite important. People would never call up and ask you for your bank details. Being online is safe. Using the mobile app is safe generally from people trying to hack into your account. But what you need to really be is just have your wits about you when you're dealing with somebody calling you unsolicited and asking for information or telling you you have malware on your machine and it needs to be fixed and these types of behaviours, which is what the fraudsters are targeting. And then for the money mules, I think there needs to be more education within the universities looking at targeting young people to say, look, this is actually something that could damage you by being involved in criminal enterprises. Well, I've been a financial journalist for 20 years and my mind has been boggled by this episode. It's really frightening to hear how young people are being targeted by fraudsters and used, even if they don't realise it, to launder the proceeds of online crime. What did Henry make of it all? So Henry, you've avoided becoming a money mule. Are you glad? Oh my goodness. Um... I've never heard of the term money mule before, so it's really useful to know that phrase. But uh, I'm so glad because a 14-year sentence is just a its a shocking amount of time. You know, 14 years is a good chunk to take over and detriment to the rest of your life, and especially if you want to go into finance. So considering I've just heard all those consequences for engaging in that type of activity, uh, I'm glad I knew that bit of uh, that phrase. It seems a bit too good to be true. Also, if you had said yes, then it would be vulnerable customers, elderly customers perhaps, who've usually banked in branch, that you would be helping to defraud. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's quite horrible because my, my grandparents, well, they live in New Zealand, so uh, a bit far away. But I can just imagine, you know, if they lived over here, then I could possibly be taking their money off of them. And so, you know, it's quite a horrible thought that people do this, but people are driven to crime for various reasons. and. I suppose the pandemic has certainly not helped with reducing that number of people going into crime either. So, Henry, does this change the way that you're thinking about all of this? To a degree, it certainly does, because I never thought at all to, you know, report this. So, I mean, next time I'm approached by something online, which is fairly frequent, like, you know, once every two months, once a month, then it will definitely be important for me to, you know, fill out that form. Because, I mean, I'm not vulnerable to that kind of attack, but somebody else who is may not know to keep themselves safe. Are you going to tell your friends about this? I'll definitely be telling some, a lot of my friends about it. And also, um, a few of us actually know they're in the same situations. They know it's too good to be true, but they don't exactly know what particularly is the scam involved. So it'd be good to tell them about this podcast and also tell them just from what I've heard. That's it for Money Clinic with me, Claire Barrett, this week. And we hope you like what you've heard. If you would like to chat with me on a future episode of the show and get some expert thoughts on a money issue that's been bugging you, then email me. Our address is money at ft.com. If you've been a victim of crime or want to report a money mule scam attempt, then check out the show notes for this episode. They're packed with links to articles I've written about financial fraud. You could also take a peek at our website, ft.com slash money, grab a copy of the FT Weekend newspaper, or follow us on Twitter at FT Money. Money Clinic was produced in London by Persis Love and Josh Delamere. Our sound engineer is Breen Turner, and our editor is Amy Keane. And the original music is by Metaphor Music. 
And finally, just so you know, the Money Clinic podcast is a general discussion around financial topics and does not constitute an investment recommendation or individual financial advice. For that, you'll need to find an independent financial advisor. That's the small print over and done with. See you back here next week. Goodbye.